Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for coming back uh, right on time. We've got quite a bit to get through this afternoon, and I didn't want to miss out on uh, you having opportunities to ask plenty of questions in our next session, uh, which this afternoon is focusing on returning to words. Oh, I'm sure what's going on there. Uh, but language records often buried within archival collections. So what are the challenges to accessing those? How do we, no, in fact, <laughs> jumped ahead, ahead of myself just a bit there. No, that is right. I am right, I'm on the right page. <laughs> so much exciting stuff to talk about today. You can understand if I'm uh, jumping back and forth a bit. So we've got uh, another three speakers talking uh, broadly around different aspects of this topic. And then at the end of that, we'll have an opportunity to have some questions. So do again, get thinking about what you'd like to ask when we have that chance at the end. Our first speaker up today is Professor Linda Bowick, uh, who's, been, who's spent her time as a professor at the University of Sydney's Conservatorium of Music and co-founder of the Pacific and Regional Archive for Digital Sources in Endangered Cultures and has been a real champion of digital methods and is here today to talk to us about what she's been doing in that space and perhaps a bit of where to from here. Ladies and gentlemen, please make her welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Tyrone and the other Ngunnamal people for their lovely welcome. And it's so great to be here with like-minded um, crowd and my hugest respects to all the um, First Nations people who are here and, uh, you know, love to, love to hear more. I hope this conversation continues. Um, okay. Uh-oh. Escape. Right. Try that. <laughs> so what is Paradisec? You might have heard the word around. Um, the Pacific and Regional Archive for Digital Sources in Endangered Cultures. Uh, it's an online archive that we established with a lot of collaboration across um, the universities of Sydney, Melbourne, ANU, and initially with, res with support from the Australian Research Council LEAF program, um, and also with fantastic advice from our national institutions about um, digital preservation, and, and I especially want to mention the National Library here, and especially uh, Kevin Bradley, who's on our steering committee. Um, and Paradisex has been built by researchers who are conscious of the cultural heritage significance of our collections and the ethical responsibilities we have to those recorded. And at present, we're very fortunate that we are the official archive for the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. Um, and we have, our collection has just mushroomed in the last couple of years. If anybody's been keeping an eye on how big it is, it's, it's now something over 50 terabytes and, and rising daily um, because of all those collections coming in. Um, initially, we were set up with a focus on the Asia Pacific because there really wasn't anywhere um, parallel, but these days we do include material from over 100 countries worldwide, including Australia. Um, we've got over 1,200 languages, 490 <coughs> collections. Um, we're approaching 10,000 hours of audio and video, um, and 325 of those 490 collections contain Pacific material. Um, biggest area is Papua New Guinea with 128, then Vanuatu and the Solomons have also got big collections. So I just wanted to say something about language keeping because there seems to be a bit of misconception that by preserving these sort of records that we're somehow preserving languages. And I just want to say that keeping of language and culture can only be done through community-led active use. And uh, as an archivist, um, I can see that reuse of archival materials is just one resource for that job that is not um, something that, that I think it's appropriate for archival institutions to be um, trumpeting as our purpose. What we're doing is making sure that our archive structure and processes support reuse, maximising the chances of those recordings being discovered by the people who need to find them, and also making materials then available to communities in suitable formats. Um, so we do this in a number of different ways. 
Um, this is just a summary, reformatting old recordings, sharing information about them online, uh, partnering with local cultural organisations, developing user-friendly systems and training upcoming generations. So I just want to speak briefly about each of those. So reformatting, um, what we start off with in many cases is collections of reels or cassettes that are sitting in the bottom of a filing cabinet um, that are actually really difficult to access. So digitising those 20th century analogue formats is the essential first step and we try and do that to archival preservation standards. But then we um, publish the metadata about those recordings. We don't make the recordings themselves um, publishable on the web. You have to go through an access process. But the information about them we think is really important to share, especially these days when communities are often scattered over large areas. Um, so, for example, through the um, uh, National Library's Trove service, you can put in the name of a Pacific language and come up with records that will take you through to the data in the Paradiset catalogue. Um, a lot of people have discovered our um, collections exactly through this process, and this is some feedback from, from one of those. Um, Eava Geta, who's a quotable speaker from Papua New Guinea, who um, was just completely thrilled to find and be able to access these recordings. Um, we have regional and international links with um, local cultural organisations in most of the um, larger um, places in the Pacific that we um, have links with, so the Institute of Papua New Guinea Studies, the Vanuatu Cultural Centre, the Solomon Islands Archives and Museum, and so on. Uh, and we also have partnerships with other endangered language archives or archives with similar scope worldwide through an umbrella organisation called Delaman. Um, and the picture is um, some people um, from the Gum uh, region in southwest China who came and visited us because there's a collection of important gum music that we hold. Um, and uh, we were delighted to be able to show them how, how our back end processes work. Um, through these links with regional communities, we're also forming partnerships and trialling and developing new technologies. So these days, a lot of people in places like Vanuatu have got, have got smartphones, and so we're developing ways that we can deliver um, our, some of our collections via a local wireless hub that is just set up so people don't have to worry about paying for data costs, but they can still download and access the materials. Uh, and so here's some people that Nick Teberg has been working with in Vanuatu, um, enjoying uh, getting some of their, some of their language uh, materials on their phones. Um, we've also got a big program of um, training. So new generations of researchers and community members, how to create and reuse contemporary collections, uh, and um, this is a picture from a, a workshop that um, the Centre of Excellence ran in Tahiti last year. You might recognise uh, Nick Evans's shirt there in the, uh, <laughs> in the middle of the photo. Um, we've also, we're very fortunate that we've got a um, speaker from um, Papua New Guinea, one of, the, um, one of our core team members is Stephen Gagao. And um, he, he, his own language comes from uh, near Rabaul in, um, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but he's also, so he's giving us incredible information about that. But as a top Pearson speaker, he can also um, relate to a lot of the collections from Papua New Guinea, but also down into the Solomons and Vanuatu as well. Um, and here he is collaborating with our depositor, Michael Webb, who's recently given us um, a large collection of music that he recorded in Rabaul. Um, and this year, because it's the year of endangered languages, of indigenous languages, we've um, got a couple of activities. One is we've got a mystery language of the week where we take a snippet from one of the uh, collections in our, in our um, 
repository that we don't know exactly which language it is, and we put one up every week, and um, you can have a look on our Facebook page, and if you forward it to people you know who might know those things, it's the power of crowdsourcing and networking, uh, we're hoping will help us to improve our metadata. Um, and we've also got a new podcast called Talk Sabe, which is hosted by Stephen Gagau and Jodie Kell, who's our um, sound archivist, uh, and the first episode, which will be released shortly, is an interview with Grace Hull, who's a Kiliwila speaker who lives in New South Wales. And um, she's given us this wonderful interpretation, including dancing and singing to some of the songs that he recorded in the 1970s uh, in the Trobrians. And um, so I, this sort of speaker perspective is what is going to be the theme of our podcast. So we're looking to put one of those out each month um, throughout this year. Um, and uh, here's some further info. Uh, and please feel free to, to contact us and have a chat anytime you like. Thanks. Thank you so very much. I'm keen to find out a bit more about well, some of the opportunities and challenges of such an enormous system a little later on when we have our chance for questions. So do get to thinking about what you might like to find out. Next is uh, Rebecca Bateman, a Wailwan and Gamilaroi woman with family from Warren in northwest New South Wales and connections in and around the region who spent a lot of time and work on managing and, and getting to the bottom of lots of information about our region and then following up the work of her family who have set up organisations to be able to carry that forth. And this, this afternoon, speaking to us about returning that culture to country and how that happens. Ladies and gentlemen, please make her welcome. Yama, before I start, I'd like just like to acknowledge the, the um, the Norwell people and the Nambri people, and particularly so give my very sincere thanks to um, Tyrone and Paul for their warm welcomes over the last couple of days, and particularly um, Jai. I was just so moved by, um, you know, Jai, seeing a young man like that standing up here teaching us his language was like, I've got a three-year-old at home and it gives me hope for her and her generation. Um, so, yeah. Um, I am the Indigenous Curator here at the National Library of Australia and um, as Dan said, my people are the Wail and, and Gamilaroi people from Central West New South Wales. Um, my mum was born on a little place called the Bee Munnel, which was sort of like um, the Aboriginal reserve outside of a town called Warren, um, up on the Macquarie River. And she grew up in Cootamundra Aboriginal Girls' Home. Um, and I've spent the last almost 20 years of my career um, working to reconnect um, Indigenous families with language and knowledge and knowing who they are and where they're from and identity, and that's what I'm really the most passionate about. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is some work that we're doing here at the library to enhance um, access to our collections by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and particularly to tell you about a ma major project, although I'll qualify that by saying we talk about this as a project, but really it's a whole suite of projects. There's a lot going on in the next few years here at, 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 at the library. My apologies, I've just come off the back of a, um, a week at the International Indigenous Librarians Forum in New Zealand. I got back last night, so if I start not making sense, I really do apologise <laughs> ahead, ahead of time. So engagement with Indigenous peoples and connecting communities with collections is one of the library's most um, important priorities. As you can see, it reflected in the strategic, the, uh, strategic priorities. Um, so at the moment, we've got a project that we call the First Nations Consultation Modernisation Project. Um, we've yet to find a... Um, a useful acronym, but we'll get there because <laughs> that's a mouthful. Um, but basically, um, this project is around. There are kind of two facets to the program to the project. One of it's around working with specific collection items and connecting those with community, and the other part is looking at how the library as a whole does work in terms of the way we connect with community and engage and um, learn from community. Um, 
So where am I? So I'll start by telling you a little bit about the collections-based part of the project. And I've gone the wrong way. Sorry. There were sort of three facets to that. This is why I'm saying this is a suite of projects. It's like a set of Russian dolls of projects, if you like. Um, so we're working with a bunch of um, six or seven collections of photographs of Pichinjara people in Pichinjara country. We have pre-established um, relationships with those people. They came here 10 or so years ago and at that time gave us some advice about, you know, those photos over there are men's business and what we should do with them and how we should protect them. And so we're picking up where that left off and um, ensuring there's about, I think, 2,500 photos across the six collections and some of them have already been repatriated to the Pijanjara mob and this is where we're picking up where we left off and, and working with the community to hand over the rest. Um, the second part is the Matthews collection and I might just focus on that today in a minute if that's okay. Um, so basically, I think there'd be quite a few people here who are familiar with um, RH, the work of RH Matthews. Um, he, for those of you who aren't, he was a surveyor in New South Wales. He worked throughout New South Wales and developed a strong interest, just a personal interest in Aboriginal languages and culture. Um, he retired in the 1890s and then became um, sort of a self-taught anthropologist and he travelled all around the state and some parts of Queensland and New South Wales and um, into Aboriginal communities, got to know them, sat down and recorded language lists um, as well as, you know, descriptions of ceremony and other cultural and social structures. Um, but what we're really focused on is are his language lists for this project. Um, we know that um, the people that he sat down and spoke to across all of these communities, there were 70 of what he called his informants, and we know that today there are 3,500 descendants of those 70 people. So our challenge is to connect with as many of those <laughs> as we can, um, which is um, obviously not without its challenges, but... Um, we're up for it. <laughs> um, so um, there's also an oral history facet of the project as well, where we hope when we reconnect with some of those descendants that we'll be able to record um, interviews with them talking about what the material means to them and, you know, what the stories are in their communities about their grandfathers and grandmothers that that told that information and just giving a whole new voice to the collection really. It's, um, it's a voice with a very Eurocentric, uh, collection rather with a very Eurocentric voice and we want to bring the First Nations voice back to it and bring the two together to tell a full story. So the Matthews collection itself is a large one. It con consists of eight series, um, but for the purpose of this project, we're only focusing on series three, which are his notebooks. Um, and it's the series that, at least here at the library, is most often accessed by First Nations people. And it's the one that consists of um, notebooks with um, language lists um, and other, other information as well, but lots and lots of language lists, which is why we want, really want to focus on that one. <coughs> um, oh, Pigeon Jar are up in Central Australia, so that's our first project. So Matthews, I'll zoom in. Oh. This is what one of his notebooks looks like. Um, so he worked over a large, as I said, he travelled over a large area. He covered from the Wiradjuri um, people out, you know, west and central west, and, and then it, it touched on where my mother from, Gamilaroi. He did some Gamilaroi stuff and some Wowan stuff. Um, the the Dorawal people of coastal Sydney and around that region, um, and the people from northern New South Wales, um, Bunjalung and um, Gabungir, and also down to the, uh, and also as far up as some of the, the Gabi Gabi people and other people in southern Queensland, and down to um, some of the nations in northern Victoria as well. So it's a huge collection and it represents a lot of different mobs, um, which is exciting, but uh, challenging. 
Now, this is um, what one of his, this is typically what one of his notebooks looks like. And I think um, I'm a bit intrigued by this because it's, it looks like a school book and it's, and it says written by Georgie Matthews. And I'm wondering whether he, you know, um, helped himself to one of his grandkids' books or something. <laughs> well, I'll take that with me. <laughs> that looks so good. Um, so, yeah, they're these um, notebooks, handwritten, pencil, sometimes very difficult to read, um, but f just bursting with rich um, information that we want to give back to the community. So, yeah, all around there. <laughs> um, So we find that currently the collection is quite heavily used, particularly in relation to native title. Um, and we're also aware that there are sensi sensi there's sensitive stuff in that collection. We know there's men's stuff, there's descriptions of ceremony. Um, and we currently manage access to the collection with that in mind by, um, we sort of have a thing if somebody wants to use the collection, we, we, we want to have permission from the community that the bit of the collection that they want, want to look at relates to. Um, and if we don't get that, well, there's not a lot we can do. Um, but we haven't had any problems so far. Um, we have identified, knowing that we can't go out to, you know, however many different communities in three years. I should have mentioned this project started mid last year and finishes mid next year. Um, we've decided to concentrate on three or maybe a few more communities, key communities that are represented in the collection. Um, so we're at Dream Mob and I was just talking to Arnie before um, and wanting to make connections out there. We want, we're going to um, Gamilaroi and the people on the south coast, you and other people on the south coast are the people that we're, we started off thinking we wanted to engage with, but since then we've had other people, other people from other communities come to us to say, hey, we want to we want to use the Matthews collection. And um, I know um, Ray is here from La Perouse and we've had some of your people up here um, looking at it and we want to continue that conversation as well. And we also had a visit from... Um, a lady who was working on behalf of the Dunaroa from um, North East Victoria. And we're also talking to the local mob about, because there's Ngunnawal material in there too. So, um, we, you know, in a perfect world, we, we would talk to as many different groups of people as that we can, um, and we will try to do that. I think that's probably covered what we're doing with the Matthews collections. I know I'm happy to answer any questions later. The, I just wanted to, I wanted to touch on the third part of our collections um, based projects, and that is some work we're doing around our published collections. So um, we're digitising material relating. Again, we'd like to digitise it all, but we're focusing in this project on digitising published material relating to Pichinjara, people and country and language, and also pu publishing Matthew's, sorry, digitising Matthew's published works, of which there are many, many um, papers and so forth that he wrote. Um, and we're mindful that a lot of the material, particularly in the Matthews published material, is the same information as what's in the unpublished. So we need to we need to be doing the same consultation around the published material as we are around his handwritten notebooks. It's no different. It's just in a different format. Um, we have already moved some stuff that might, that had already been digitised or for whatever reason, and we're um, really working hard to make sure that um, sensitive material has something physically on it as well, a cover, a wrapper, so that people are, are alerted, not to stop people from looking at, but people can make an informed decision whether they want to look at it or not. So that's the collections based part of the project. And I'll move on now to talk to you about the other bits of the project. The first part is what we're calling decolonising the catalogue, which is a fairly ambitious phrase, but um, a really exciting one. So. Um, The project has provided the National Library with an opportunity to look at how we describe and catalogue First Nations material 
um, and in particular published material. And it's a really important part of this project. Um, it's around improving the description of First Nations material um, at the library and in our catalogue so that it's more discoverable and people can find it. Um, generally speaking, the First Nations material here in the library is not particularly well identified or helpfully described in terms of um, language material and finding language material in the collection. Um, so the, this project is also about rectifying that. The description of First Nations material is a problem for all Australian libraries and it comes from um, the fact that there are historically inadequacies in international library cataloguing standards when it comes to dealing with um, specific, more specific things. Um, the great variety of spellings, of course, of languages also adds to the complexity. Um, so up until late 2018, the standards contained a single language code. So if you were cataloguing an item in an Indigenous language, you could use one, one code to flag that item is in an Indigenous language, which um, is helpful, but it's if you want to look at information in Aboriginal languages, but it's not helpful, for, helpful if you want to find information in Wiradjuri or information in Pijanjara or Gamilaroi or Dungadi or anything else. So, um, in late last year, um, the National Library alongside IATSIS secured approval um, from the Library of Congress to replace that single code um, with the codes described in Auslang. Auslang is, is a web-based sort of database that the IATSIS has developed and it assigns a unique alphanumeric code to each um, of the 1,200 languages that that, he, um, that are in the database. So each of these dots is now a unique code where before um, one code covered them all. That just means that material is so much, or will be moving into the future, so much more discoverable. Um, so the library is implementing those codes this year. Um, there's training, there's workflows being put into place, there are guidelines to, develop it to uh, cataloguing Australian First Nations material that have been developed um, and training that has been provided around that. Um, and the library is working in partnership with IATSIS throughout 2019 to um, raise awareness of this work and to encourage other libraries to adopt it as well. Um, there are going to be webinars later in the year and it's going to culminate in, um, and there are, sorry, there are going to be online um, training materials as well available for libraries across Australia. And um, it will culminate in NADOC week where um, the plan is to have a codeathon, um, so get the libraries in competition with each other and see who can upgrade mo more of their codes. Um, I don't think that's, yeah, that probably covers that, that part of it. Now there's, um, depending on how you're counting it, maybe a fourth part of the project. And this is the bit that I'm probably, at the moment, spending a lot more mental energy thinking about, and that's um, consultation framework. Um, so it's about looking, this part is about looking more broadly at how the library engages with First Nations community and about making recommendations for how we do that in the future. So we're doing a lot of things, I like to think we're doing a lot of things in this project. We're digitising, repatriating, describing, providing access and engaging with community. But I think almost the thing we're doing the most of in this project is learning. and. Just about everything in this project is a learning opportunity. So we want to consolidate that. We don't want to lose that. We want to bring it all together. So one of the, pro the products th that will come out of the project will be a framework um, for how the library engages with Indigenous communities now and into the future. Um, not necessarily one that's set in stone, but one that puts us in the right direction and can be reviewed and come back to over the years. It'll come, that, that framework will come out of, as I said, reflection 
on this project, but also looking at other projects and other work that happens at the library where Indigenous engagement is really important. Um, for example, in publishing, um, that happens quite a lot. You know, in the provision of reference services and other um, working with other collections, connecting communities with other collections. We're also looking at industry-wide guidelines like the ATSI Learn Protocols, which some of you might be familiar with, and the 10-year roadmap. Um, sorry, that's been developed to guide the work that uh, galleries and museums do with Indigenous cultural, cultural material and engaging with Indigenous communities. So we really want to know what's already out there and um, how we can learn from that and how we can make something really solid and meaningful for the library going into the future. Um, and that pretty much brings me to the end of my talk, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Rebecca Bateman, thank you so much. And there's so much going on in that digital space. I'm interested in that codathon. I think that's going to be uh, quite a heated uh, fight there of who can get the most information up online. Now, you've probably heard both of our speakers touching on this trove, uh, this incredible resource here at the library that, well, perhaps is a bit underutilised. Our next speaker is going to talk to us about that and perhaps how to use it better. Alison Labrovsky moy is a Wurundjeri woman from central New South Wales. She works here as a Trove Indigenous Outreach Project Officer and has been giving advice to the Trove Modernisation Project uh, Program rather as well uh, to get more content from First Australians into Trove and also making it easier to find that information as well. Uh, speaking today about the discovering First Nations content in Trove, Alison Lebransky moy ladies and gentlemen, please welcome her. by itself, excellent. Excellent, um, so I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, uh, the custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend um, that respect to Aboriginal Torres Strait, Island, uh, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations people who might be here today um, or also watching online. Wambana, welcome. My name is Alison Lebransky moy Thanks, Dan, for the intro. I'm a Wiradjuri woman and my people from Tumut in Western New South Wales. I'm the Trove Indigenous Outreach Officer at the National Library of Australia. For those who haven't interacted with Trove before, it's the National Library's online resource discovery platform. It's a place to discover, immerse oneself, and engage with the many voices that make up our Australian community. My role is to engage with communities to seek their views on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander content to be digitised and to work with them to get that onto Trove. I'm also providing advice to the Trove Modernisation Program, which has a strong focus on increasing First Nations content and making it easier to find Indigenous language content in Trove in a culturally safe space. You may not have heard of the Trove Modernisation Program before, but it covers research and activity, research and activities Trove has been involved in since early 2017 to speak to our current and prospective users, improve the service and ensure it has a strong future. It's supported by funds allocated by the national, the nas sorry, it's supported by allocation, funds allocated to the National Library from the Public Service Modernisation Fund and is scheduled to run until mid 2020. There are seven projects as part of the modernisation, each focusing on improving a particular aspect of Trove. These include how content is searched for and accessed in Trove, the way the service looks and feels, and how we use Trove for analysis and research. Trove has more than a thousand partners that share their collections with us. These partners range from state, state libraries and major cultural institutions to local historical societies and community groups across Australia. Since Trove was launched in 2009, the way, users, the way users access information and the kinds of information they use most has changed. 
The amount of digitised content in our collection has increased dramatically and 90% of the visitors to Trove access this content. Our visitor numbers are growing steadily, as are the organisations who want to partner and share their collections with us. Trove is also changing to better reflect the needs of all Australians. A consistent message we've received from our research is that Trove needs to become easier to use and understand for a wider range of people. As a government funded service that is free for users, Trove relies on, a on having a diverse and thriving community of users for future sustainability. Our aim is to make Trove a more open and welcoming place, not just for our current users, but for Australians of all ages and backgrounds. As part of the modernisation, Trove will become a culturally and more linguistically diverse platform. Some of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander enhancements in Trove, we hope to have in Trove uh, coming later this year, is a dedicated First Nations landing page which will aim to showcase some of the content we have. Implementation of cultural warnings, displaying cultural identifiers on search results, the ability for Indigenous partners and communities to create their own collections, and the implementation of Auslang in Trove. As mentioned, Trove will become a culturally safe space for our Indigenous users, and with the enhancements such as the addition of culturally specific warnings and identifiers, Trove, the new Trove will be a culturally safe one. All Australians should be able to see themselves and their families' history in Trove. This will be complemented with the addition of Auslang. Searching for old documents that mention language groups on Trove can be really hard. As you've heard today, it's a pretty, pretty strong message. Traditionally, Aboriginal languages were purely spoken languages, and it wasn't until after European settlement that spellings were created, but they varied from writer to writer, with the standard transcription conventions not being created until the 20th century. Auslang provides information about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, which has been assembled from a number of reference sources and allows variant names and spellings. With the use of Auslang, the definitive thesaurus of Australian languages developed by IATSIS, visitors to Trove will be able to search and browse for collection items in language. For example, Gamilaroi, a language found mostly in southeastern Australia, has a number of alternative spellings used currently and historically, including Camilleroy, Gamilleroy, and Wallaroy, and that's just to name a few. Auslang will allow you to input any spelling variant and available content on Trove will appear in your search results. As a current example, if you search Trove for Aboriginal music, you can bring up some amazing interactions, including this digitised sheet music for Song of the Women of the Monero Tribe. When looking further into the details of the search, you can see that the language is listed as Australian languages. Unfortunately, there's no way for Trove to currently differentiate or identify the language used in the piece of music unless you, the user, are able to personally identify it yourself. You can also see a similar problem with this next piece of digitised sheet music to Aboriginal songs, Maranoa Lullaby and Jabin Jabin. This search outlines English, multiple languages, and Australian languages in the metadata, as you can see there. This is likely due to the lyrics being translated by H.O. Lethbridge. However, the language it has been translated to is unknown. Another example is in the metadata for this 1807 map of Sydney, which simply says, give some Aboriginal place names in the notes. On this search, the language is identified as English only. Therefore, we can't determine the language and you'd have to be super sleuth to find this one on any search map search that you happen to do on Trove. Um, as you can see by the examples highlighted here, you know, finding First Nations content in Trove is really, really difficult. Uh, current users mis use, uh, currently risk missing key items in searches due to the lack of identification capabilities available. With the introduction of Auslang codes, 
the search results will be far more defined with searches producing items that may currently be missed. IATSIS has commenced implementing Auslang into their online collection. This give you, gives users the ability to search and filter by a particular language. As you can see on the slide behind me, there will be far more options for users to search by and the ability for Trove to generate a far more exhaustive list of items available. For users of Trove, the introduction of this technology will be invaluable for the user experience in the First Nations context. IATSIS and the National Library will be the first collections to include these Indigenous language markers in the metadata. Trove is a wonderful treasure chest of history and this wouldn't be possible without the partnerships that we form with many organisations and individuals. One of the partnerships the Trove Outreach Team facilitates is what we call digitisation partnerships. <clears throat> Under this arrangement, we invite organisations or individuals to select content they would like to see in Trove and the National Library of Australia manages the project for them. To date, we've partnered with over 150 organisations such as libraries, historical societies, universities, schools, businesses, local councils, faith, cultural, community groups, as well as individuals to digitise specific newspapers, journals and books. In a recent project, the National Library partnered with the Northern, area, the Northern Peninsula Area State College and James Cook University, who provided permission and source copy to digitise the Bummerger High School magazine with a date range of 1973 to 2004. <clears throat> Dubbed Australia's northernmost mainland high school, Bummerger State High School, now the Northern Peninsula Area State College, lies just 40 kilometres from Cape York's tip. The Bummerger High School magazine was the first school yearbook to be digitised to Trove a project achieved through the partnership between the College, the National Library and the State Library of Queensland. Digitising collections such as the Bumaga High School magazine, making them available on Trove, enables Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives and voices to be visible, heard and cherished, not only by friends and family to whom the collections matter the most, but by a national and global audience. We have many First Nations titles coming, becoming available on Trove. The next is the Taurus News with a start date of April this year. Trove also offers, offers content partnerships where under these arrangements, an organisation gives Trove's, Trove permission to harvest metadata describing their collection so it can be discovered on Trove in the context of all other collections. We have around 1,000 cultural research and community organisations from around Australia, such as IATSIS, who share and expose their wonderful collections in this way. As you can see, 2019 is a particularly exciting year for Trove, and I'm really excited to see the Indigenous enhancements come to life. From seeing more First Nations content become available and highlighted on Trove, to becoming a more culturally safe space for our Indigenous users, and quite possibly the biggest enhancement, the ability to search Trove in language. It's really exciting to see the National Library become one of the first to provide these ind Indigenous markers in the collection metadata. At Trove HQ, we're always looking for ways to better our service and the way we work and to better the experience for our users. And we always welcome feedback that you might have. Come and say hello to me reach out on our social media platforms or you can also reach us through Trove itself. Thank you for attending today and for those who have tuned in via social media, thank you for listening in. I trust that I've been able to give you a small insight and I say small insight because this is just a tiny bit of what we're actually doing this year. Um, but there's a lot of really exciting changes uh, coming. So please stay tuned um, and I'll finish by saying mandangu, which is thank you and yirurumurung, good day.
Alison, thank you so much. And God, it sounds like there's so much going on this, this year. And I imagine you could talk to us for hours about the range of programs you have. I might ask our panellists now to come and join me uh, on the panel here to take your questions. So that's Professor Linda Barwick, Rebecca Matt Bateman and Alison Lebransky. Moy, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Make them welcome, please. And do we have a question to start us off? Oh, come on, don't be shy. They covered a lot of ground there. Yeah, that's right. You've, you've done your job very well. Well, I wonder if I might uh, start with the professor. Oh, we have got one. There, you saved me from asking one of my questions. You could do yours next. Yeah, sounds fair. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of you. Just had a question about, I think it was Rebecca mentioned the um, training, the workshops training and so on for implementing the codes. Um, is that is that kind of internal to the National Library or is that something that would be broader? Uh, mm. No, there are... Um, in fact, my colleague um, Libby up there is probably better placed to answer this question, but no, it's not internal, just internal to the National Library. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I might, I might let... Sorry, Libby, are you happy to answer that one? <laughs> Hello, I'm Libby Cass from the National Library. Um, our intention is to um, develop our capacity internally first and then working with the Libraries Australia Network, roll out some training via the user groups to cataloguers. They're our primary audience for implementing um, Auslan. So I'm happy to talk to you about that more. Is there anyone else who had a, a question there? While you're thinking about that, Alison, I just wanted to find out, how do you get more people aware of Trove and into their sharing their resources, their stories, and also using those that you have? Thank you for your question. Um, so the role that I currently sit in is a um, newly created role. Um, it's an identified role. Um, and so obviously I work primarily with uh, First Nations content. Um, so my job is obviously to engage with communities. So we're just, t you know, starting to just touch the surface with that. Um, so it will literally be going out to communities, obviously with their welcome, um, and uh, trying to unearth what they have and, um, you know, uh, seeking their agreement to have it digitised and then obviously put onto Trove. Um, that's a small bit of it. Um, we obviously, things like this help us to um, introduce those who, you know, haven't heard of Trove before and there are people who haven't heard of Trove. Um, if you haven't, welcome, enjoy it, you'll love it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just about that engagement, finding things um, that, uh, you know, haven't been digitised, so that could be Indigenous-based uh, magazines and things like that that are no longer in print. Um, or available online for whatever reason that might be. Uh, same with newspapers and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's just a lot of mm. engagement with, the, with communities. And I might open that up to the rest of the panel as well, of how do you engage and get people interested in, in understanding what you're doing and, and being a part of that? Professor, we'll start with you. Well, part of it's coming to things like this <laughs> and relying on the power of networking because I think that's something that um, is just amazing. I mean, so many people here know so many other people and, and that word of mouth is actually where you get, I think, really, really good quality engagement. Um, with Paradiset, because we've got such a huge, widely dispersed um, collection, We've really tried to concentrate on developing relationships then with those local cultural hubs. So, um, you know, working with um, people who know people. And the other thing that I think is really fantastic to see that we're really seeing some benefits of is making sure that you've actually got people from those communities employed within your organisation. So for us, having um, Stephen Gagau on board has just transformed the possibilities for our um, relationships with um, Papua New Guinean language speakers in Australia, but also more broadly right around the Pacific. And, um, you know, it's... it's uh, 
it's it's something that I think is is really needed and. Uh, you know, to all those First Nations people out there who are considering careers in um, library, uh, libraries and archives and so on, I think that is just a, a marvellous uh, direction that is very, very much needed. I reckon that's one that you're going to get agreement from the Director General who is here, I'm sort of nodding away there. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to weigh into that? Of how, how do you engage, how do you cut through with so much information on social media and, and in the broader media? Um. It's a, it is a very big question um, and in the years that I've been around it's a question that I've thrashed over in my head many, many times. Um, aside from just the enormity of how much information we have to connect to people, there's also this historical um, disconnect, I guess, between um, many um, First Nations people and libraries and other organisations that quite frankly look like another you know, institution and can be quite daunting um, places. So a um, lot of thought about how, how you break down those barriers, how you make it not such a, an overwhelming experience to, to come to a library or use a library's um, collections. And I think the work that um, Alison is doing with Trove to um, make that a more Indigenous space is a really good example of how you do that. Just to jump in on that point, it can be quite confronting to go into big, enormous yeah. buildings like this one. What about using the resources online? Is Do you think that holds the same sort of uh, dauntingness? I think it's probably, um, probably not so much. Um, it's still, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done with Trove and it's, you know, it can still be daunting. It's still, you know, if you don't know how... Oh, it's hard for me to say because I've been working in libraries for 20 years, but if I hadn't been, I think I would find, you know, approaching those kinds of systems um, could be quite mm. challenging. Um, I just think about my my mum. Um, she would never have... She would never have... I used to do a lot of family history research for, for her and the rest of the family. I could never show her anything online. I always... It didn't matter what it was. I always had to print it off and take it to her and show her a print copy. Cause yeah, something it, about holding it, perhaps. Yeah, and just not... not not being able to get your head around looking at something on a screen. Uh, the Director General's got a question. I was going to say, Dan, that I think um, we would be really absolutely upfront in, say, uh, the trove of today, and in fact, most online services of most institutions like us do not look friendly for Indigenous people. It, it looks like a white person's space, um, and um, it can be really, con you know, daunting. It's daunting for lots of people because it's kind of big and complex. Uh, but certainly with the team, as we've been thinking about reinventing Trove, my touch point has been if we can make this a, an online space that is friendly and welcoming for multiple Indigenous communities across Australia, it will be friendly and welcoming to everybody. So it's kind of flipping how you're thinking about um, what what success looks like and you might still take 20 years to get there but you think about it like that yeah, so well, those yeah. sorts of things aren't it, overnight it's easier are they? to change it than it is to change the building yeah, yeah. Uh, so lots of nods of agreement where you were talking about the interfaces and how challenging they can be were there any other questions there yes over here oh, kia ora koto um just got a query about sort of turning things around, the lens around a little bit and looking at collecting um, language material being produced today. One of our language researchers in New Zealand said that she f believes all the written Māori being produced at the moment is being produced on social media platforms, which has got huge implications for collecting institutions like our National Library and the Turnbull Library. Um, is that happening here? Are, are there Australian languages being, Indigenous languages being used in social media and, and is that impacting on... The, uh, the, the institutions that are collecting. We might start with you, Rebecca, and I'll, I'll open up that one to the panel. So, sorry, Paul, your question was around the use of social media. Um, yeah, I think um, Alison spoke about the Varga magazine. I think that was a really good example. Um, former staff member who was from that community was instrumental in, in, in that project in getting those magazines um, digitised and online and nothing she... I remember her saying that nothing, um, you know, 
did a lot of work around getting the word out about that, but nothing worked like social media, mm. you know, that grapevine. <laughs> um, so I think it is a really powerful tool and we need to think um, perhaps more concertedly about how we use it and harness the power of that tool. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to weigh into that one as well. Um, yeah, look, not a, not a huge lot to add to that um, other than to say that, you know, I think um, just thinking about Trove social media, um, we have our own social media um, uh, person within Trove and we're constantly showcasing things um, and, uh, you know, we're obviously trying to just, um, I guess, drive that interest to direct them to Trove so that they can start that process. Um, I, I think it's about just getting people to, to actually get to Trove and, and have that first look. Once people, you know, touch the surface, they just find all this stuff that they never knew was there. Um, so social media definitely, um, whether it's, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all that sort of stuff, um, our community of users uh, use it heavily. Um, I speak for Trove. I'm not sure about the National Library as such, but for Trove, it, it's definitely... We have a great community. Um, and I think today, you know, this weekend is a perfect example of, of how social media can, you know, work wonders. Um, I mean, there's people who are watching us live right now. Um, they could be in a little remote community somewhere that, you know, logistically they... It would be a nightmare to get here to, but they can log on to Facebook and they can see exactly what we're saying now. So it's a definitely a very important tool. Yeah, Linda, do you want to weigh into that one as well? Um, yeah, um, obviously... Um, you can't ignore social media in, in operations today. Um, I, one other aspect of your question that I think I'm, I'm grappling with and I'm sure all, all our um, institutions are is the amount of, of language that's actually being developed online and being used online and, and, you know, how can you do a proper documentation of a language without reflecting its, its changing um, media for use and considering the ways that the online platforms themselves constrain the kind of language that you can use, whether it's changing, uh, needing to adapt yourself to 140 characters, which I think maybe has been removed as a as an obstacle now, but uh, or just the difficulty of interacting with keyboards for languages that are written in non-Roman script, or um, how do we have meaningful engagement using uh, non-verbal means of communication? Um, think of all our sign languages and so on. So uh, I, I certainly don't have any answers to that but I do think it's it's something that that really needs to be taken seriously if you know in in a hundred years time people are saying well you know how was language developing in Australia um, how can we ignore what's happening there but at the same time how can we actually get to grips with that mass of data that's out there and I wonder if part of your question was about social media being an incubator of uh, language and the way that that changes. A and to that end, I think that there are two, uh, in a broad sense, two types of social media. There is open source, open platform, where anyone can see and interact. And there's closed source, which, uh, p from my experience reporting in the Northern Territory, is much more prominent in remote communities, so things like WhatsApp, where you've got to be invited in, which I think has is more conducive to using language that's not mainstream English or I whatever the, the main language of the nation is. So, but certainly some interesting views. I think we've got time for one more, just up here. Before I did retire from um, Facebook, I used, to, I used to be exposed to a tremendous volume of uh, young people's chatter, backwards and forwards. Um, mostly grandchildren, great-grandchildren of people that I'd known in the 1970s but who kept in touch with me partly through this medium and put me on their lists. Um, but uh, I was usually just the voyeur uh, and what was going past me was a, was a, uh, a rapidly developing new language 
um, full of abbreviations that were, became more and more obscure, sprinkled with Aboriginal words from the region, um, uh, some of them quite rude, and, uh, and sometimes these, uh, the postings were in fact quite aggressive and, and uh, uh, vicious. Uh, so there's a, there's a real privacy problem in capturing what is actually uh, uh, something that probably is not going to be captured anywhere else, and that's young people's uh, interaction in language. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the big challenges uh, that's being grappled with around the world, when, you know, with the uprise of fake news and the like as well. We've run out of time in this session. Please give it up for our panel th this afternoon. <laughs> Professor Linda Barwick there, Rebecca Batemans and Alison Lubransky-Moy. Great to have you all along. Thanks for your speeches.